Okay. So this is just kind of a more detailed picture of the kidneys and the urinary tract. So we said that they, the kidneys help influence our blood pressure to help control it so that it stays in a normal level. Um, they release renin, which activates that renin angiotensin system that I talked about um, to control our blood pressure. Um, that renin angiotensin system um, will secrete certain things that help increase our blood pressure and, uh, and our volume when they sense that it is low. It will cause increased blood flow to the kidney, which also can lead to water retention or excretion. Um, let's see. So we are going to talk about diuretic agents. Who knows what a diuretic agent is? What do you think a diuretic agent does? Get rid of excess water in your body. Exactly, very good. So when we talk about the function and indications for diuretics, we will use these to increase the amount of urine that's gonna be produced by the kidneys. Um, it increases our sodium excretion and water will follow, water follows sodium. Um, we would give a diuretic to a patient who has edema that could be associated with congestive heart failure. Um, we would give it for a patient who was having pulmonary edema um, like fluid in the lungs. Sometimes we give it to patients who have liver disease. Patients that have liver disease, such as cirrhosis, have a lot of what we call ascites. So their bellies get really big and swollen and they have a lot of fluid on them. Um, <clears throat> we give it to patients that have renal disease because the kidneys can't operate properly to help pull that fluid off. So it needs a little help. Um, we also will give a um, patient that has hypertension a diuretic. That's actually the first type of a pill that we give a patient that is newly diagnosed with blood pressure issues. We try and give them a diuretic because a diuretic will remove the salt from their body, which decreases that water and it decreases their um, circulating volume. So their blood pressure comes down. And then we also give it in certain conditions that cause hyperkalemia. So there's a lot of different reasons. So we have a couple different classes of, there's actually five classes of diuretics. They each work a little bit different um, at a different site in the nephron, or they use a whole different, completely different mechanism. So we have your thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. We have your loop diuretics. We have carbonic andrace inhibitors. We have potassium sparing diuretics. And then we have osmotic diuretics. So this gives us a great picture of where these different diuretics work in the kidneys. So in this area here is where your osmotic diuretics are gonna work. Um, your thiazide, your thiazide-like diuretics, um, your spironactolone, that's gonna work here in that distant convoluted tubule. Um, loop diuretics work exactly like they, are um, named. They work in that ascending loop of Henry. Um, these carbonic um, andrace inhibitors, they are going to work on the descending loop of Henry. So the different diuretics work in different areas, but they do produce the common effect of being able to pull water off. So thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, these work by reducing the ability of the kidneys to be able to reabsorb salt and water from the urine and in the body. So when that happens, it increases the production and the output of urine, so it causes diuresis. Um, how, do, how do they work? They, their action is to block the chloride pump it keeps chloride and the sodium in the tubule to be excreted in the, in the urine. This prevents the reabsorption of both in the vascular system. Uh, we would use these for treatment of edema, like I said, because of the, um, congested heart failure or renal disease. We could also use it in patients that have liver disease. Um, and then we could also give um, the hydrochlorothiazide is one of the medicines that we give for the treatment of hypertension. Um, so this medicine is very well absorbed in the GI tract. Um, 
you would not want to give to a patient that has an allergy to these diuretics. Um, you definitely want to watch your fluid and electrolytes. You're going to want to um, do strict eyes and nose on these patients. Um, sometimes we have to be very careful when we use these in patients that have bipolar disorders. Some of the medicines that they take can be affected by the changes in calcium levels. So these diuretics are going to affect our electrolyte um, levels. So we just have to use it very, very cautiously. Um, we also want to use these cautiously in patients that have diabetes. Um, it can worsen that um, elevating glucose effect. Um, let's see. Patients who have lupus, um, it can cause some changes in the kidney and their renal function, which could cause renal function. So we just have to be careful. Um, Whenever we give a patient a diuretic, we run the risk of causing the opposite problem. So we could cause hypokalemia. We could lose potassium. Um, hypokalemia is low levels of potassium. We could pull off too much and we could um, cause hypokalemia. This is all gonna make a lot more sense when you guys um, do homeostasis. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, drug to drug interactions, you guys would want to be careful if you are giving this with um, digoxin. The risk of digoxin toxicity, we talked about digitox, will increase because we're changing the potassium levels in the patient. Um, so that's something to be careful about. The most common medicine that we give are these um, two right here, this hydrochlorothiazide, the hydrodural, or the um, diurese. These are the two most common ones that we give. All right, our loop diuretics. They are diuretics that act on the ascending loop of Henle in the kidney. So the most common that we give in the clinical setting is furosemide. 90% um, of the time we give that. Um, when these patients are taking um, a Lasix holiday or it's not working enough, I've seen them add on the Demodex or the terosamide or the... Um, Bumetadine, or it's also called Bumex, but these are your loop diuretics. So these block the chloride pump in the ascending loop of Henle, which causes the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. We would give this to patients who have um, acute um, congestive heart failure, any type of pulmonary edema, um, edema associated with liver disease or renal disease. And then also sometimes they use these for hypertension. Um, we would want to monitor their electrolyte status. Um, we wanna look at all those levels every day to make sure that we're not taking their electrolytes the opposite level, um, that they're not too low. Um, Let's see, you wanna use these cautiously in patients who have severe renal failure. Um, sometimes because of the um, blood flow changes that, that diuretics cause inside the kidneys, it can actually keep the diuretic from working or it can put them into a crisis with their kidneys. So you just have to be really careful with patients that have severe renal failure. Um, Patients with liver issues, you have to be careful. Um, there is some fluid shifts that occur when we give these diuretics and they can cause um, um, hepatic issues to be worse. Um, let's see. These medications, we talked about those. If you're using these medications with some of your anticoagulants, they can increase the um, effects of that anticoagulation um, drug that you're giving. So you would wanna be careful there. Um, okay. Your potassium sparing diuretics, these um, 
are medications that do not promote the secretion of potassium into the urine. So this is not going to alter the effect of your potassium in your body. Um, they cause a loss of sodium, but they allow the body to hold on to the um, potassium. Um, you would give these to patients um, who are at risk for developing hypokalemia because they won't have this issue if you give them a potassium sparium um, di diuretic. You can use it as an adjunct with your thiazide or your loop diuretics. Um, in patients who have hyperkalemia, you would not want to use this because they already have an elevated um, potassium level. This is going to cause your body to hold on to potassium, which would make the hyperkalemia worse. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's it for potassium. So then we have our osmotic diuretics. So this is a diuretic, um, is a type of a diuretic that inhibits the reabsorption of water and sodium. So um, mannitol is one of the main osmotic diuretics. It only comes IV. And what this does is it pulls water into the renal tube, into the renal tube but it does not allow the sodium to be lost. Um, you would use this medication for patients that have an increased cranial pressure or any kind of acute renal failure um, that, that's caused by trauma. It could be due to drug overdose um, or any kind of shock. So patients that have pulmonary condition, um, pulmon any kind of pulmonary congestion, you would very, very, very cautiously use this medication with them. It could exas exacerbate um, their issue because of that large shift of fluid. Um, patients that have CHF also, again, because of those large shifts of fluid. Um, this medication can cause some nausea, vomiting, and hypotension. Any of these medicines, um, before you give them, you always want to check the blood pressure and their heart rate because these will inc um, are going to decrease your, um, they're going to pull fluid off, so they're going to decrease that circulating volume. So they are at risk for low blood pressure and low heart rate. So the nurse would instruct a patient receiving a loop diuretic to report um, yellow vision, weight loss of one pound a day, muscle cramping, or increased urination. What would we want them to report? So let's go back to our loop diuretics. So these diuretics cause the reabsorption of sodium um, they can cause hypokalemia, which means that we can pull too much off. So we can also cause hypocalcemia. Remember I said we can um, cause these levels to be too low. Um, it's always a fine line when you're working with diuretics and fluids, you can cause too much, you can cause too low. It's really a balancing act. Um, so if you have low calcium or you have, um, low potassium, this can cause um, issues with your muscles, it can cause um, shakiness, it can cause heart issues because your heart is a muscle, um, it can cause some confusion, some disorientation later on once things progress. So what do you think the answer is to that question? C. C, muscle cramping, yep. I say A. It's C, muscle cramping, because of the low levels of potassium and calcium in the body, they affect the muscles. So you guys actually don't have all my notes. Do you guys want me to share my slides that have all the notes that I have in them for you guys? Sure. I can, I'm also gonna post them for you to download because you're not gonna be able to write down all the notes that I have. I didn't realize that your copy doesn't have um, my notes on it. Let me share mine. Let 
can you guys see mine now? You can see, right? It's not gonna be real big because there's notes in there, but okay. So here's a second one. The nurse would anticipate an order for a loop diuretic as the drug of choice for a patient with A, hypertension, B, septic shock, C, pulmonary edema, or D, fluid retention of pregnancy. Ms. Davis, we can see the answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, that one is C. So yes, pulmonary edema. All right, thiocyte diuretics are considered mild diuretics because they block the sodium pump in the loop of Henle. They cause loss of sodium and chloride, but little water. They do not cause fluid rebound when they work in the kidneys or they have little or no effect on electrolyte levels. What do you guys think? They reduce fluid. So. Is it C? They do not. Is it B? And be probably 10 degrees cooler tomorrow. And then we look at the spun band into the west. There's more rain developing out across the Midwest. It's in summer. Right, and in the 70s and 80s down across the south. We'll Somebody needs to put their phone on mute. Okay, so B is the answer. They cause the loss of sodium and chloride, but little water. All right, so we're gonna talk about drugs that affect the urinary tract and the bladder. So urinary tract, urinary tract infections are the second most common infection in the United States. They're obviously more common in females and patients with indwelling catheters or when we um, intermittently catheterize a patient, which means they don't have a catheter all the time. It just means that when they start to retain, we take a kit that looks similar to a catheter, but it doesn't have the bag attached to it. We go in like we would um, to put in a catheter, we pull that fluid out and then we remove it. That's what we call an intermittent catheterization. So the catheter doesn't stay in. So some of the signs of a UTI, you're gonna have urinary frequency, you're gonna have burning, you can have pain, you can have urgency and frequency. Um, if it progresses, you can have um, pain in your, um, in the flank area, you can have blood in your urine. You'll have it like a really terrible grabbing pain. Like every time you try to pee, it'll just be really tight and grabbing. Um, if it's gonna, if you're getting septic or it's getting worse, you could have chills, um, fevers, um, cause it's gonna progress into your kidneys and then it can move into your bloodstream and cause a systemic infection. This is something very common that we see in our older adults. Um, they present with confusion and they have, they're actually septic from a UTI. So it's very, very common in our older adults. So how do we treat UTIs? Well, we give them antibiotics, um, specific agents to sterilize the urinary tract. Um, we also give them drugs that block the spasms of those urinary tract muscles because when you block the spasm, it decreases the pain. The, sp the spasms can be extremely painful. Um, we decrease urinary tract pain by giving them a medicine called, um, called peridium. It works great. Um, it gives them immediate relief, but it does cause their um, urine to be bright orange. So that is a little bit of teaching you would want to do with your patient. Um, it decreases the urinary tract pain. It protects the cells of the bladder from irritation. Um, and then we give... Um, for men, we would just treat the enlargement of the prostate because that is what is causing their UTIs most of the time is that prostate becomes enlarged. So we have to give them medication. One of the medications that we use all the time is called Tamzulosin or Flomax. You guys will see that a lot in the clinical setting. So this is in your book. This is the site of action um, that the drugs act on in the urinary tract. 
Um, so for men that have BPH, um, they can use alpha blockers that help treat that BPH. That's gonna work here on the urethra. They can use certain um, testosterone blockers, um, which would work in this area. Um, our urinary analgesics that help with pain, that's gonna work um, in this area right here. Um, the urinary tract anti-infectives are gonna work on this bottom in a, um, epithelial level, uh, endothelial level of the bladder. And then those antispasmodics are gonna work on the muscle layer. So there are a lot of different medicines that we can use to treat UTIs. Um, we use certain anti-infectives that are designed to work in the urinary tract and they help to destroy bacteria. Either it, the medicine works in two ways. It's either gonna be an antibiotic that has a direct antibiotic effect on the bacteria, or it's a medication that's gonna cause an acidification process um, through the urine that's gonna kill the bacteria. Um, the antibiotic that they have is not gonna be a systemic antibiotic it's only gonna work in the urinary tract. So we have different types of medicines. We have Cinebac, we have Neuroxin, um, Phosphomycin, we have Neg Negram and Furidantin or Nitrofurantin. Um, I would say out of all these drugs, I don't see any of these given actually except for the Nitro, um, Purantum. The main medication that I see given in the clinical settings is Macrobid. That is the drug of choice now. Things have changed. I'm not telling you that so you guys would choose that answer in a question. I want you guys to know these medications, um, but this is what your book recommends. But this nitrofurantum, I do see this being used in the clinical setting. So if your patient is receiving this Sinovac, this medicine works by interfering with the DNA replication of that gram negative bacteria that's causing the UTI. So it keeps it from, um, it makes it not be able to replicate anymore. And then the bacteria die. If you're given the neuroxin, this is effective against um, even more gram negative um, strains then, and it gives, it'll kill more um, of those strains than the previous medicine that we just talked about, the Cinebac. Then the Monoril, this is convenient in that you only have to take one dose. So this might be a good option maybe for a patient who's not compliant with their medications. Um, then you have the Negram. This is a, a very old type of a medicine. Um, it's not very um, effective against as many strains of the gram-negative bacteria, probably why I've never seen it prescribed. And then this nitrofurantum, we, we do see this um, still prescribed. It is an older drug. Um, it has a very short half-life, so it does not stay in the body long. It does have um, some unpleasant GI side effects, so they recommend that you take it with food. Now, the second class of these medications are these anti-infectives that help acidify the urine that then kill the bacteria. So that would be your Hyprex. Um, this medication undergoes metabolism in your liver and then it is excreted in your urine. Um, and it also comes with um, dosage guides for children and it comes in a suspension form. So this medication could be used for children and adults. And then the other medication that works to help acidify the urine is that methylene blue. Um, it is widely distributed, metabolized through your tissues. It's excreted in your urine, in your bile, and your feces. So then we talked about those antispasmodics are gonna keep the um, those spasmings from happening. So when, um, when you try to actually pee and start a stream, that spasm occurs, which makes it feel like that grabbing feeling. It can be extremely, extremely painful. This is when you can see in severe cases bleeding. So they work by blocking, blocking the spasms of the urinary tract muscles. They work on that parasympathetic activity by blocking it and they help relax the detrusor 
um, muscle and the other urinary tract muscles. So if they're relaxed, they can't spasm. So you would give these to your patients who are suffering from dysuria or bladder spasms. Um, these medications are rapidly absorbed and widely distributed. They're gonna be metabolized in your liver and excreted in your urine. Um, you wouldn't wanna use if you have an allergy to any component of this medication. Um, if you have a pyloric or any kind of duodenal obstruction, which was, would be an obstruction in your stomach area, you would not wanna take this medication because the, um, those anticholinergic effects can cause serious complications. Um, if you've had any recent surgeries, it could cause a hemorrhage. So you wouldn't wanna give this medication to a person that's had any recent surgeries. Um, if your patient has obstructive urinary tract issues, it could um, further aggravate them because it blocks that muscle activity. And then um, those anticholinergic effects can be exacerbated in patients that have um, glaucoma or myasthenia gravis. Um, the um, adverse changes that they would see. So it's gonna be related to um, what occurs in the body whenever we block that parasympathetic system. So we're gonna see that nausea, the vomiting, um, those um, uncomfortable anticholinergic um, um, side effects that we see. So that dry mouth, um, an increased heart rate, vision changes, nervousness. Um, and then if your patient is taking hair, um, Haldol, we would give Haldol for patients who have, um, who are really confused or combative. Um, those medications would, you would see a decrease in their effectiveness. Um, and the phenothiazines as well, if you're giving with these medications, they wouldn't work as well. So it is something to think about. Then we talked about urinary tract analgesis, on analgesics. So azo um, is the standard medicine that we give. It's gonna help with that pain. So azo is actually, um, you can buy it over the counter. They sell it, this particular brand for a lot of different things. You can buy it at Walmart, CVS. Um, and then you can also get a prescription, which is the same thing. It's the peridium, but the peridium and the azo both change your um, urine to a bright orange color. So you would definitely wanna educate your patients on that. Um, so we would give this to help our patients relieve their symptoms if they had a urinary tract um, infection. Um, maybe they had some kind of urinary trauma or if they've had any surgery, can also help relieve the pain there. Um, it is rapidly absorbed and it works very, very quickly. Um, it's widely distributed, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. Um, adverse effects, you could get a stomach ache, some GI upset, some patients see a headache or a rash, and then we have those uh, that reddish orange coloring of the urine. Um, sometimes in some patients, they are prone to renal and hepatic toxicity. Um, and then you wanna remember when you're taking this medication along with any kind of antibacterial agent, the risk of um, toxicity effects of this drug increase. So you just wanna be careful. All right, and then the drugs that we give for our patients, our male patients that have that benign prosthetic hyperplasia is gonna be our Flomax, or we call that um, Tamzulosin. And that's the most common medicine that I see. Um, I'd say in the past two years, I've seen a lot of this Terazosin um, also being prescribed. So not only for this, but also for hypertension as well. And the other name for that is Hytrin. So these drugs work differently depending on the type of drug. We do use it to treat that benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Um, uh, use cautiously in patients who have hepatic or renal dysfunction. Some adverse effects that you might see is headache, fatigue, maybe some dizziness or postural dizziness. So when you change positions, some patients report lethargy, um, tachycardia, hypotension, and some GI upset. Um, they might also report decreased libido or impotence. 
and issues with their sexual dysfunction. So you just wanna be careful when you're taking this medicine, this theophylline, which we give for COPD. Um, it can cause low blood pressure when they are taken with the Flomax. So you just wanna be careful. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the gastrointestinal system. So this diagram is in your book. This is just a little outline of the GI system. Um, so the GI system is actually composed of one continuous tube. It begins at the mouth. It's gonna progress all the way through the esophagus, down to the stomach, um, through the small intestines, into the large intestines, and then it ends at the anus. So one continuous tube. Um, there are accessory organs related to this system, and that's gonna be your pancreas your liver, which is over here, and your gallbladder. So what are the major functions of the GI system? Um, so we have secretion, absorption, digestion, and motility. So when we digest our food, um, digestion is nothing more than the process of breaking down food into usable, absorbable nutrients. That's why we take in food. It gives us nutrients for our body. Um, the digestion process is gonna start in our mouth. Um, as soon as we take in food, the saliva is gonna excrete certain enzymes that are gonna start breaking down that food. The stomach continues that con um, digestion process, um, also secreting certain enzymes. And then in the small intestine, the food mixes with the bile um, and it starts breaking down the fat molecules. When we talk about absorption, absorption is that active process um, that involves removing water, nutrients, and a um, couple other different elements from the GI tract. Once they remove these um, nutrients and water from the GI tract, they are delivered into our bloodstream and our body uses them. And then motility. So motility, G, your GI tract depends on what they call an inherent motility to be able to keep everything moving throughout your system. Um, when we think about things that are in the esophagus, the basic movement is peristalsis. It just kind of pushes things along. So the stomach uses um, three muscle layers to help produce what they call a churning action. Um, the small intestines use a process called segmentation, and then the large intestines use a process called mass movement. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those. So the, we're gonna talk about the control of the GI system. So our GI system is controlled by what they call the nerve plexus. Um, it controls the GI system by maintaining an electrical rhythm and responding to local stimuli. So either you're increasing activity or you're decreasing activity. Our autonomic nervous system influences all the activity in our GI system with that sympathetic system, which is gonna slow down everything. And then our parasympathetic system comes in and increases everything. And the initiation of activity depends on what's going on in the body. So we do have a couple different types of secretions that come from our GI tract. So we have saliva. So our saliva contains water um, and digestive enzymes. The secretion comes from those salivary glands, and that's what actually starts that digestive process. And it helps to facilitate our swallowing because it gets everything wet and it makes our food slippery and it helps it to go down. Um, mucus is very important. It's produced in our mouth. And its purpose is to protect the epithelial lining and also to help us aid in swallowing. The esophagus does produce mucus to protect a lining of our GI tract and to um, further facilitate that movement of our food um, down the esophagus and into the stomach. When our food gets into the stomach, we're going to see the stomach produce um, a lot of different acid and digestive enzymes. Once that food arrives in the stomach, um, it secretes an enzyme called gra um, gastrin. Um, it, the gastrin comes from our G cells, and this is one of the biggest stimulators of acid release. Um, the gastric chief cells release what's called pepso, um, pepsinogen, and this, um, through a couple different processes, is eventually activated to the enzyme pepsin, and that 
enzyme. Pepsin helps to break down all of our proteins. Um, we have secretin, which is um, when our food, or they call it here a bolus, when that food or bolus leaves the stomach and starts to go into the small intestine, that's when secretin is released. Um, it stimulates the pancreas to start secreting large amounts of um, sodium bicarb. The sodium bicarb helps to neutralize the acid in the food. Our pancreatic enzymes, so our chymotrypsin and our trypsin, these two enzymes work to break down proteins and make them into even smaller amino acids. We have other lipases that work to help break down the fat in the food. And then we have amylases that are secreted to help break down the sugars that are in our foods. Um, these enzymes are delivered um, directly to our each um, GI tract. They come from our common bile duct, um, which is also shared with our gallbladder. So when we have fat in our food, um, the gallbladder works and contracts and releases the bile into the small intestine. Um, the bile contains um, what they consider a detergent-like substance that further breaks apart all of those fat molecules so that they can be processed and absorbed. The bile in the gallbladder is produced by the liver during normal metabolism. So if anybody here has ever had issues with their gallbladder and you've had to have it removed, this is what happens when, if you have a gallbladder issue, it can't um, break down the fat. So what happens is when you eat a fatty meal, your gallbladder gets inflamed and you have this terrible, terrible, terrible pain. Um, in response to the presence of food, your small intestine and your large intestines um, are gonna secrete a lot of different endocrine hormones. Um, a couple that we talked about before are that um, aldosterone, the glucagon, the growth hormone. They also secrete a large amount of mucus because that mucus is gonna help move that food through the rest of the GI tract. We have central mediated reflexes of the GI tract. We have a swallowing reflex. So, the swallowing reflex is gonna be stimulated whenever we put food um, in our mouth and it's gonna stimulate pressure on the receptors in the back of the throat and our pharynx. This impulse is, these are gonna send um, impulses to the medulla in the brain, which stimulates a series of um, different nerves and a series of reactions. This whole process involves more than 25 different muscles. Um, and this reflex can be facilitated in a number of other ways if swallowing is a problem. Um, the vomiting reflex is another basic reflex. Um, the vomiting reflex is stimulated by two different centers in our medulla in the brain. Um, the more primitive center they call the emetic zone. Um, when it's stimulated, it initiates projectile vomiting. This um, reaction is usually seen in younger children. And whenever increased pressure in the brain or brain damage allows more of that primitive center to override the more um, mature chemoreceptors. And then maintaining homeostasis of the GI tract. So this is gonna involve um, a series of a couple different local reflexes within the GI tract. They're gonna to work to always maintain um, a quality or homeostasis in that system. So any kind of overstimulation is going to result in constipation, which is underactivity in our GI system. And then we can also have diarrhea, which is overactivity. Ms. Davis, can you let Raven in, please? Yes. Okay, so drugs that affect our gastrointestinal secretions. So a lot of the patients that you guys are gonna see in the clinical setting, I feel like abdominal pain, GI issues are a very, very, very common acute issue that we see in the hospital. They're very hard to diagnose. Um, 
It's one of the most common complaints that you see in any kind of practice, clinical practice in primary care or in the hospital. Um, there's a lot of different products that are available um, so that we can self-treat um, our issues. So we can self-treat if we have stomach upset, if we have acid indigestion, heartburn, sour stomach, there's a lot of different things. Um, again, if you look in, um, in your book in box 57.1, there's a lot of the over-the-counter treatment. Just remember these over-the-counter drugs, we always want to make sure that when our patients come in, um, if they come in with abdominal pain, we want to make sure we're doing that good thorough interview process and find out what over-the-counter medicines they are taking. Um, if any of them help their issue, if it made it worse, what they've tried, what they haven't tried. Um, especially when we think about our patients who have constipation. Um, a lot of patients need to take something on a regular basis to help with constipation. Some people take a colace once a day. Some people take fiber every day. Some people take a colace twice a week. Some people take Miralax every day. Everybody has their own regimen. So if you are taking care of a patient and you notice that they haven't had a bowel movement in a couple of days and you start talking to them about constipation and they say they need something, Thing, just make sure you always ask them, what do you normally take at home? Because you want to keep them um, as accustomed to their um, same regimen that they have at home. Um, so we said that there are a lot of different um, GI disorders that we deal with in the hospital. Um, um, there's a lot of them, too many to name, but you can um, have issues with um, dietary issues that cause um, stomach issues. Stress causes ulcers. Um, you can have hiatal hernias, which are is a little thing that develops in your stomach and it keeps that little closure um, area in between your esophagus and your stomach. It keeps it open a little bit and your food starts going back up. That can cause pain. Um, we have GERD, which is um, acid reflux. A lot of patients have that. Um, Sometimes we can take medication that causes um, GI issues, and then we have peptic ulcer disease. So there's a lot of um, GI disorders out there. So when we give medications for GI issues, they usually um, work to affect the GI secretions. So um, when we treat peptic ulcer disease and certain disorders like GERD that have increased acid in the stomach, we want to give them medicines that help decrease that um, GI secretion activity, right? If they have too much acid, we want to give them medicines that's going to re um, stop the acid from overproducing. Um, so some of them slow down the secretion process. Some of them block the action so that they don't hardly make any secretions. Um, other medications work to help protect the GI lining and coat the lining. Um, so when those erosive enzymes are in there, it doesn't cause any further damage. Um, sometimes we can give medications that help replace um, enzymes that are missing um, and things like that. So there's a lot of different um, effects that these medications have. So when we talk about patients that have ulcers and the medications that we give for the treatment of ulcers, we have a couple different type. So we have your histamine blockers, which are your H2 antagonists. These are your famotidine or your pepsid or your reninidine or your Zantac. Zantac is actually recalled. Um, I don't see it in the store anymore and there's actually a lot of lawsuits behind this medication, but it's still listed in your book. So I have it on your slides. We have antacids. Um, you guys are probably pretty familiar with these. So these are your calcium salts, which are your Tums. And then your magnesium salts, which is your milk of magnesia. And then we have what we call protein pump inhibitors. That's your omeprazole or also named Nexium. So your histamine antagonists, these medications work to block the release of hydrochloric acid. Um, hydrochloric acid is produced in response to gastrin. Remember we said when the food comes in, um, gastrin is released into the stomach. So this medicine works by blocking hydrochloric acid, which is produced by grass, um, gastrin. So it interrupts, um, it interacts with acids to help neutralize them. That's what the antacids do, sorry. 
Um, the proton, proton pump inhibitor, inhibitors, they suppress the secretion of the hydrochloric acid into the lumen of the stomach. So the hydrochloric acid doesn't even get into the stomach. Um, the actions, they work differently according to the medication. Um, we would give these medications for short-term treatment of a duodenal ulcer or any kind of benign gastric ulcer. Um, there is something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, with it, which is a hypersecretory condition that um, produces a lot of um, stomach acid. We would give it for the treatment of that. We would give it prophylactically to, re, um, to prevent stress-induced ulcers and acute upper GI bleeding in critical patients. So a good percent of the time, I'd say 80% of the time, you will give this in the hospital prophylactically um, because studies have shown that when the body is under stress, and I mean stress by like the body's sick, you have an injury, whether it's just bronchitis or pneumonia, or you've been in a motor vehicle accident, it's stress to the body. Stress to the body can cause a GI ulcer. So we want to try and prevent that with people who are in the hospital. So we give them a prophylactic dose of um, pantoprazole. Um, the other name is protonics, where you usually give them 40 milligrams a day. So it's um, one of these medications you can give prophylactically or you can give it for GERD. So when you're telling your patients what medications you're giving them, you don't wanna say, I have your um, protonics for GERD because then they're gonna say, what? I don't have GERD. Do I have GERD now? Well, no, you don't have it. Maybe we're giving it to you prophylactically. So what I like to do is when I'm giving that medication, I ask them, do you have GERD? Do you have a history of any kind of acid reflux? And if they say no, then I say, okay, well, we're giving you this medicine prophylactically because this is what we want to prevent. Um, it's indicated for the treatment of erosive gastroesophageal reflux and the relief of symptoms of heartburn, acid indigestion, and sour stomach. Um, you need to use these cautiously in patients who have hepatic or renal dysfunction. Um, they do cause some GI effects. You can have diarrhea or constipation. Um, it can cause some CNS issues in some patients, um, dizziness, headache, confusion, even hallucinations. I've never seen that, but it's possible. And then um, possible to see some cardiac arrhythmias and hypotension with them H2 antagonists um, because they're also a cardiac receptor blocker. Um, commonly, you mainly see these if they're given IV or with an IM administration or if they're on it for a longer period than is recommended. Um, there's a long list of drug interactions. Um, one here, you don't want to take with alcohol. You want to use cautiously with beta blockers, um, warfarin, lidocaine, benzodiazepines. There's a lot on there. I'm going to post these slides so you guys will be able to um, grab them. But these medications slow the metabolism of um, the drugs that are in the stomach. Why do you think that they slow the metabolism of the drug? Why do you think that happens? What does the acid do in the, if we don't control the acid release, what does the acid help do? It breaks things down. So it controls them breaking down. So if they don't break, then I guess they can absorb this. Would that be right? Yeah. So if we're decreasing the acid in their belly, it's going to decrease the metabolism of things in the stomach, right? Because normally, normal acid levels will work to help metabolize things and move things along. So if we decrease that acid, whoops. Sorry, where was I? That's what's gonna happen. So you just wanna be careful with those medications. Our antacids, they're gonna work by neutralizing the acid that's in the stomach through some type of chemical reaction. Um, we would use these for just occasional upset stomach, um, which is caused sometimes by too much acid in the stomach. Um, you wouldn't want to use if you had an allergy. Um, you want to use these cautiously because any with any condition that can be exacerbated by an electronic 
imbalance. So sometimes we give these Tums not for an antacid, but because they have calcium in them. So people who have low calcium, they're recommended to take a Tums. So if a patient has high calcium levels, maybe that's not the medication that you guys are want to give, right? Um, patients who have a GI obstruction, um, you would want to use cautiously in them because it's going to interfere with um, the systemic absorption um, of the drugs and it can increase those adverse effects that you would see. So adverse effects that we can see would be related to their effects on that acid base level and your electrolytes. Um, sometimes they can cause rebound acidity, which is where their stomach produces more acid in response because we have an alkaline environment. Um, sometimes it'll cause alkalosis. Your patients will, will get um, nauseated, vomiting, neuromuscular changes. They can have muscle twitching, um, hypercalcemia, just what we talked about. Um, maybe some constipation or diarrhea, depending. Um, hypophosphatemia, so that's going to be low phosphorus. Okay, those proton pump inhibitors, these work at a specific um, surface receptor that secretes acid. Um, it prevents the final step of acid production, so that final step never happens, so it decreases the level of acid that we find in our stomach. So we would want to use these in patients for short-term short use that have um, current active um, duodenal ulcers, that gastroesophageal reflux disease, which we call GERD, um, patients that have erosive esophagitis, and then any kind of benign active gastric disease. And then long-term treatment, you can use these medications for those um, conditions where they, the um, stomach acid is just overly secreted over and over and over again. Um, CNS effects, might see some dizziness, headache, maybe some vertigo, trouble sleeping. Diarrhea and abdominal pain is one of the big things I see um, patients complain about. Maybe some upper respiratory symptoms, um, cough, stuffy nose, and then some patients could have rash, alopecia, which is where you lose your hair, pruritus, which is um, dry skin, back pain, fever, a lot of different side effects. So this is good for you guys to look at. This talks about your H2 blockers, um, how it breaks things down, how it works. Talks about your proton pump inhibitors and then your um, omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor. So, when we talk about drugs that we use to treat ulcers, so we have antipeptic agents like sucrophate, which actually works to coat the belly. And then we have prostaglandins, um, the medication, the main um, prostaglandin that we give is. Myo, misoprostol. So sulcrophate, or also known as caraphate, or misoprostol. So antipeptic agents, these coat any injured area in the stomach and they help prevent further injury from acid. Um, they inhibit the secretion of gastrin in the um, stomach and they increase the secretion of that mucus lining. Um, so the, that mucus lining is gonna serve as a protector and then they're gonna inhibit the secretion of that gastrin so the acid levels are gonna be decreased. Um, it forms an ulcer adherent complex around those duodenal ulcer sites and they help to protect the sites against acid, um, the release of pepsin and those different bile salts. Um, you want to use these medications cautiously in patients who have renal failure. You can see there's a lot of adverse side effects with this medication. Um, constipation, diarrhea, nausea are some of the ones that I see most commonly in the clinical setting. Um, there's always the possibility for indigestion, gastric discomfort, dry mouth. I also see um, some patients report dizziness, sleepiness, vertigo, which is where you're dizzy. Um, skin rash and back pain. 
You might see a reduced effect with any type of aluminum salts or um, fluoroquinolones or penicillins, reduced effect of those medications. And then when we talk about the misoprostol, the prostaglandins, these medications work by inhibiting gastric acid secretion and they increase bicarbonate and mucus production in the stomach. Um, we use these for the prevention of NSAID induced, induced gastric ulcers. Um, a lot of use of NSAIDs will cause gastric ulcers in patients. We also use it for the treatment of duodenal ulcers. Um, you're gonna see some GI effects and some GU effects. So your GI effects would be nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, flatulence. I've seen patients complain of fat, um, flatulence and constipation. Might also see some vomiting or some dyspepsia. Those GU effects could cause um, in women miscarriages, um, excessive bleeding, spotting, um, cramping, hypermenorrhea, so um, periods that take a long time to stop, dysmenorrhea, um, and then different menstrual disorders. So this is in this slide is in your book. This is the different sites of action for the different drugs that we talked about. So we also have patients that may require digestive enzyme supplements. For one reason or another, they don't have the enzymes necessary to help break down their food. So digestive enzymes, like we said earlier, are substances that we see produced in our GI tract. They help break down our foods. When we break down those foods, they are then used for usable nutrients. Um, that's the whole goal, right, of taking in food is so that we can obtain those good nutrients. Um, there are some patients that have had strokes, um, some patients that have salivary gland disorders. I'm, um, I'm thinking of patients that have had um, like um, oral cancer of the mouth, tongue cancers, things like that, where these um, salivary glands can be disrupted. Um, ex surgery of the head and neck. And then we have patients that have cystic fibrosis or pancreatic dysfunction. These are the type of people that you might see that help need these enzyme supplements. Um, there are two enzymes that are available for the replacement in conditions that occur from a lower than normal level of enzymes. So for, um, we have a saliva, a saliva substitute, which is called mouth coat or salivart. And then we have pancreolipase, or it's called, the other name that we call it is creon or pancreas. So the saliva substitute that works, it contains electrolytes and carboxymethocellulose to act as a thickening agent in dry mouth conditions. So, um, it's a substitute to the saliva. It doesn't make the saliva, but it helps um, to prevent the dry mouth. And then those pancreatic enzymes that we talked about, they are replacement enzymes that help the digestion and absorption of um, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So um, we would wanna use the um, saliva supplements cautiously in patients who have congestive heart failure, hypertension, or renal failure, because there could be an abnormal absorption of electrolytes, which could lead to um, cardiovascular um, overload. And then we would want to use these pancreatic enzymes cautiously in patients who are pregnant or lactating. Adverse effects that we see from the saliva supplements, um, these would just be complications from abnormal electrolytes, increased levels of magnesium, sodium, or potassium. Um, the pancreatic enzymes, you could see GI irritation if you don't take, usually when this medicine is given, it's given with food, with meals. Um, so if you take it with um, food, hopefully you won't have that GI irritation or nausea. Some patients say that they have abdominal cramps, usually if they don't take it with food, um, and then diarrhea. And you wouldn't want to take this without food because these enzymes, what's the whole goal of them? They're helping to break down that food. So if they're not eating, they should not be taking them. Um, 
because it kind of defeats the purpose. All right, I keep forgetting I'm sharing my stuff with you. So a nurse is caring for a patient receiving pancreatic enzymes as a replacement therapy. Um, the nurse should be assessing the patient for A, hypertension, B, cardiac arrhythmias, C, excessive weight gain, or D, signs of GI irritation. D. You said D? D or B? D. D is in D. D is in dog. Okay. The answer is actually B, because remember, these pancreatic enzymes can sometimes cause um, electrolyte imbalances. So if we, uh, if we cause a problem with our potassium, potassium levels high or low can cause cardiac arrhythmias. All right. Cytotec or misoprostol is a prostaglandin that is used to A, prevent uterine contractions, B, prevent NSAID-related gastric ulcers in patients that are at high risk, C, decrease hyperacidity with meals at bedtime, or D, relieve the burning associated with hiatal hernias at night. Okay, this one is B, right? Yes. Yep, prevents NSAID-related gastric ulcers in patients at high risk. Very good. All right, so now we are going to talk about drugs that affect gastrointestinal motility. All right, so there are certain drugs that we can use to help um, control the motor activity in the GI system or motility. Um, there's a couple different ways that we can do it. They can be used to speed up or improve the movement of intestinal contents um, along the GI tract when the movement becomes too slow or if it is too sluggish. Um, because we want to allow for proper absorption of all those nutrients and excretion of wastes, as in constipation. Um, we can also use these drugs to increase the tone of our GI tract um, or, and to stimulate motility. They can be used to decrease movement along the GI tract when rapid movement decreases the time for the absorption of nutrients, which causes a loss of water and nutrients and the discomfort caused by diarrhea. So we can use it for constipation or diarrhea. So there's a couple different types of laxatives. We have chemical stimulants. Our chemical stimulants are gonna be our Dolcolax, our Senna. Also Senna is called Senecot or castor oil. Um, we can use bulk stimulants. This would be your Citrusel your Metamucil and your Fibrocon. And then we have lubricants. So this would be your Docosate Colase. So chemical stimulants such as Docolax or Senna, they directly stimulate that nerve plexus that we talked about in the intestinal wall, which will cause increased movement and the stimulation of local reflexes. Laxatives, Classified as chemical stimulants include the Dolcolax. Um, there's one called Cascara. We have castor oil and Senna. So in the hospital, you will see Senna, maybe castor oil, and definitely Dolcolax. So these are chemical stimulants, okay? They cause increased movement and the stimulation of local reflexes. When we talk about bulk stimulants, you also hear them used interchangeably as mechanical stimulants. These are laxatives that cause the fecal matter to increase in bulk, okay? So what happens is they increase the motility of the GI tract because they actually increase the size of the fecal matter. Um, if you increase the size of the fecal matter, you're gonna pull in more fluid into the intestinal com um, contents, 
when your um, fecal matter increases in size, it's going to stimulate those stretch receptors that are located um, in your intestines that are going to signal that peristalsis. Um, and it'll get everything moving. So your bulk stimulants, this would be your Citrusil, your Fibrocon, or your Metamucil. This is fiber. So it's gonna bulk everything up, make it bigger. When you make it bigger, it's gonna um, stimulate those stress receptors and cause that peristalsis to get rid of everything. And then your lubricant. So sometimes we want to just make defecation easier without stimulating the movement of the GI tract. Um, this is how we do it with lubricants. So if you have a patient that has hemorrhoids or patients that just had some type of rectal surgery, um, or maybe like a pregnant woman who just had an episiotomy, something like that, they might need lubrication of their stool. Um, patients who could, um, that have a lot of straining, can also benefit from this type of a laxative. This helps the intestinal contents move more smoothly. So um, we talked about cascara. That is a reliable agent that helps lead to intestinal evacuation. We have Senna. This is a very um, reliable, long-term used medication. Um, it's been used for years. It's very similar to cascara. It is an over-the-counter medication. You can buy it in CVS, Walmart, Target, Walgreens. You have castor oil, which is a very old medication um, that they use to help evacuate stool from the intestine. And then you have um, Docalax, which is a very popular over-the-counter medication that we can buy um, in Target, Walmart, all those good all those over-the-counter medications. Um, so these are just some little diagrams. You can look at this. It'll show you how it, some different medications work. So those lubricating laxatives. Um, we have docosate cholase. This is the one that we give the majority of the time in the hospital. We have glycerin. You can give this as a, um, so, Let's back up a little bit. The cholase or the docosate, this has what they call a detergent action um, on the surface of the intestinal, that bolus. It helps to make your stool softer um, so that it's not hard and it'll come out easier. Then you have glycerin, which is um, a hyper osmolar laxative, which is used to evacuate the stool from the rectum without any systemic effects um, in the higher GI tract system. And then you have mineral oil, which forms a very slippery coat on the contents of the intestinal tract. Um, the mineral oil we usually give um, as an enema. Then we have um, some gastrointestinal stimulants. So we have um, ilopan or reglin, Never given ilopan, I give reglin all the time. Um, ilopan increases the acetylcholine levels and stimulates the parasympathetic system. Um, it's used for prevention of intestinal atony or loss of intentional muscle tone, which happens sometimes in post-operative situations. Remember we say everything goes to sleep. Um, and then the reglin, reglin works by blocking dopamine receptors and makes the GI cells more sensitive to that acetylcholine, which ultimately leads to an increase in GI activity, which causes rapid movement of food through the upper GI tract. It helps relieve GERD and it prevents nausea and vomiting. I give it a lot of patients um, just for nausea and vomiting. So these medicines work by um, stimulating that parasympathetic activity in the GI tract, increases GI secretions and motility. Um, we want to use this when we want to rapidly move GI contents. Um, you would not want to use in a patient who has a GI obstruction, contraindicated, right? Um, things are obstructed, there's nowhere for it to go. So we don't wanna keep forcing it to move along. Some side effects that you see with these medications, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, right? 
Um, if we're trying to increase motility, again, with the fluid, it's kind of like a balancing act. Sometimes we cause the opposite problem. Once they're constipated and now the next day they have diarrhea, um, you can, it can see some intestinal spasms, some cramping, um, decreased blood pressure and heart rate. Why do you think um, we could see decreased blood pressure and heart rate? What do you guys think? Anybody want to take a guess? Well, I know that um, sometimes if um, patients strain to go to the bathroom, it can cause decreased heart rate. Yes, by that so, vaso. Mm -hmm. Right, from that vaso, 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 vaso response. Yeah. So I wonder if this could have anything to do with, I don't know, I'm just going to guess that causing causing it to move along faster than they're ready for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it could, it. yeah, it could. So if we give this to them and they're constipated, but now they have diarrhea, if they keep having diarrhea, what's that gonna cause? Dehydration. Dehydration. If they're dehydrated, what is the nursing word for dehydration? If you guys don't know, it's okay. You're gonna know in a couple weeks for sure. It's hypovolemia, so our circulating volume is low. So if our circulating volume is low, then our blood pressure is going to be low, right? Um, our heart rate can also be low, um, and it can also cause weakness and fatigue. So does that kind of make a little, are you starting to see how that would happen in the body, right? If we have diarrhea, and then we have um, low circulating volume, low blood pressure. Um, Medications, if you take these stimulants with digox digoxin, it causes decreased absorption of that medication. So they might have those irregular heart rates because we use that medicine to control their heart rate. Um, with cyclosporin, it's gonna cause a decreased immunosuppressive effect and it can cause toxicity of the medication. And then if they take with al alcohol, it can cause increased sedation. So you just wanna be careful. These are your anti-diarrheals, so got to go, got to go, got to go. These are your lopramides, which is also amodium, and then your lamotil. Um, you give these to patients who have um, diarrhea, so um, you want to watch out for dizziness, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting. Um, GI distress, and if we're stopping them from having diarrhea, what do you think we can cause? Constipation. You got it, constipation. Um, the only time you would not give modium in a patient that has diarrhea is if you have not ruled out whether or not they have C. diff. So if your patient starts having frequent loose stools, you would want to send a stool culture off first, make sure that they don't have C. diff, and then it would be okay for you to administer any of these medications to help with the diarrhea. Um, with C. diff, you don't want to stop the diarrhea. You want to get that out of the body. Um, another thing that you guys may see um, in the clinical setting in the hospital is patients that are addicted to drugs, um, particularly heroin, will can and will abuse a modium in like boxes and boxes, like five or 10, 20 boxes a day. In high increments, a modium will cause the same effects as heroin. Um, and it's not detected in their urine. So that's just something for you, just a side note for you guys to think about. So our anti-diarrheal drugs, this is our Pepto-Bismol. I think everybody's seen that, the pink medicine. We have your lopramide or your amodium, and then you have opium derivatives, um, paragoric. So anti-emetic agents. So these are medicines that are going to help with nausea and vomiting. Um, nausea and vomiting is very common. 
and it's very uncomfortable. I don't think anybody here that has ever had nausea and vomiting has said that they like it. They want it to stop immediately. And then we said earlier that vomiting is a complex reflex reaction to many different types of stimuli in the body. Sometimes we wanna induce vomiting and sometimes we wanna stop it. So if a patient has taken some type of, a, um, if they've overdosed or if a small child has swallowed something poisonous, then we wanna do things and give them medications that will help induce vomiting. Um, and then there's the majority of the time, um, if you guys work in the acute care setting, you're going to give antiemetics to stop vomiting. So it's just what we said. Um, in some cases like overdose and poisoning, it's desirable obviously to induce vomiting, to get rid of that toxin. Um, sometimes they do something called a gastric lavage, which is used to clear the contents of the stomach. That's usually done in the emergency room. And then we can give emetics, which are drugs that cause vomiting. Um, are no longer recommended for at home used to be that there was medicines you could buy over the counter that you could do at home for poison control. They don't um, recommend them anymore. So anti-emetics, if we're not giving them an emetic, which is a medication that causes vomiting, then we're given anti-emetic, which is a medication that stops you from vomiting. So this decreases or prevents nausea and vomiting. It can be centrally acting or locally acting, and there are varying different degrees of effectiveness, depending on what medication you are given. So this slide is in your book. This is gonna go over all the sites of actions of the different anti-emetics and emetics that are available. Um, the type of medications that we give, these are the centrally acting antiemetics. So you have your phenothiazines, you have your non-phenothiazines, that's gonna be your, um, your reglin. You have anticholinergics and antihistamines. So this is your meclizine and your cyclazine. Um, we have serotonin receptor blockers. These are gonna be your um, odansetron, which is also known as Zofran. A lot of you guys have probably heard about that. And then we have your substance P neurokinin one receptor antagonists. That's gonna be your amend. Um, the most medicine, the most common medications that I give is the metoprolide, which is the reglin. Sometimes I give meclizine and I give Zofran all the time. Zofran, you have to use cautiously, especially in pregnant women, because it is known to cause birth defects in children. They have a lot of um, lawsuits against them right now for that issue. Um, so when we talk about our phenothiazines, these work in our body to depress different areas in our central nervous system. It helps treat nausea and vomiting. The side effects of this, these type of um, antiemetics is that they can cause drowsiness. Um, the non-phenothiazines, that's gonna be your reglin. These act to reduce the responsiveness of nerve cells. Um, in the CTZ to the circulating chemicals that help induce vomiting. These help prevent nausea and vomiting. Um, these adverse side effects can be drowsiness, fatigue, restlessness. Something big that you guys wanna know with these, this class of medications, Reglin, is that it can cause extrapyramidal symptoms. These side effects include those involuntary or uncontrollable movements. You might have tremors or muscle contractions. And then those anticholinergics or antihistamines, that's gonna be your meclizine or your um, cyclozine. The anticholinergics act as antihistamines and they block the transmission of impulses. They prevent and treat nausea and vomiting, um, drowsiness, is something that's very common with all of these, maybe confusion, dry mouth, anorexia, some people say urinary frequency, um, the Zofran, which is the serotonin receptor blockers. These block the receptors that are associated with nausea and vomiting. They control, um, obviously, nausea and vomiting. Um, used cautiously in patients who are pregnant, and then these cause headache, drowsiness, Myalgia is urinary retention, 
That is something that I see um, constipation. And some people, when you give it IV, they say that it burns. Um, one thing about the Zofran is that, especially in patients who are um, drug seeking or that have drug issues, they will order these medications in what we call a cocktail. Um, so what will happen is you will have a patient that says, oh my God, I'm in so much pain. I need Dilaudid right now. So you go, you get the IV Dilaudid. Well, two minutes later, they say, oh my God, I am so nauseated. I need you to give me some Zofran. Well, which is nausea is a common side effect from IV pain medicine. Well, then after you give the Zofran, then they say, oh my God, I'm so itchy from the medicine that you just gave me. I need you to give me IV Benadryl. So all three of those medications are what we call a cocktail and they will ask for it. And they, it's, those patients are very hard to manage. Um, so you just wanna be careful. That's not anything you're gonna be tested on. It's just something to think about because when we give these medications, they do cause drowsiness. So these are a class of medications that we give sometimes with pain medicine because in legitimately in patients that are not drug seeking, it does cause nausea. So you, but you also wanna remember if it causes drowsiness, it's gonna affect their respiratory status. You wanna make sure that their blood pressure isn't really low. So you just really need to think before you give these medications, what's their blood pressure like? What's their heart rate like? What's their respiratory status? Um, so it's not just, you're not really just thinking about the nausea and vomiting. You have to kind of look at the big picture. Um, and then the amend, which is that substance P norokinine one receptor antagonists. These act directly in the CNS to block receptors that are associated with nausea and vomiting. Um, we use this in combination with other agents to help prevent nausea and vomiting. Um, you can give them orally. If, when you give them orally, they're gonna be metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine and feces, and some side effects that patients complain of. Um, anorexia, so loss of appetite. They might have fatigue, constipation, or diarrhea. Um, if you're running their labs every day, you might see a spike in their liver enzymes um, and maybe some dehydration. There's another medication on here that um, you won't be tested on, but it's Ativan. So in chemotherapy patients, we give patients Ativan to help control their nausea. It's one of those drugs that was created for one reason, but it also works as another reason. So when we've exhausted all of these, plus there's other medications out there that we haven't talked about, then we can give them Ativan and it works very well um, to help control um, nausea and vomiting in them, in those chemotherapy patients. All right, so this is everything for GI and GU. The next thing that we are going to talk about, and we're going to keep going is we only have a couple slides. So, we are gonna talk about respiratory system, upper and lower. All right. So we're gonna talk a little bit about oxygenation. So this is our respiratory tract. So we have the upper respiratory tract and then we have the lower respiratory tract. The function of our respiratory tract is to bring oxygen into our body. It's gonna allow for exchange of gases. So we're gonna expel that carbon dioxide and other waste products. Um, so in our upper respiratory tract, we have our nasal cavity, we have our larynx, our pharynx, our trachea, and our bronchus. Um, and then further down inside the lungs, we have, if you remember from anatomy and physiology, um, we have some mucus in there. We have those cilia, which helps move and get rid of the things that we don't want in there. We have the epithelial cells, those goblet cells. And then further down, we have the terminal um, bronchioles and those little alveolar sacs. Remember those little alveolar sacs, we want them to stay open to get as much oxygen in there as we can and be able to exchange that carbon dioxide so that our respiratory system is functioning appropriately. Um, 
We do have several different um, respiratory um, protective features in our upper respiratory tract. So we have hairs that are in there to help filter out the air um, and kind of trap anything that we don't want in our upper respiratory tract. We have those goblet cells, which help produce mucus to help trap any unwanted material. Um, we have those cilia, which help move back and forth. Um, they help move that material that gets trapped towards the throat so that we can swallow it and get rid of it. Um, the blood supply close to the surface helps warm the air and it's going to add humidity, which helps ultimately improve our gas um, movement and then the exchange of those um, gases. And then we have a cough and a sneeze reflex, which helps clear our airways. So um, what happens with our cough reflex is that the walls of the trachea and the bronchi are very, very sensitive to any type of irritant irritation. When those receptors that are located in those walls get stimulated, then it causes a central nervous system reflex, which is initiated, which is that cough, which causes air to be pushed through that bronchial tree um, and helps clear the airway of whatever that irritant was. And then we have the sneeze reflex, which is initiated by receptors that are located in our nasal cavity, which forces foreign materials out of the system. So then we have our lower GI, um, I mean, our lower productive, oh my God, I'm losing it, our lower respiratory tract, which is composed of, um, on that slide we showed just a couple of minutes ago, those smallest bronchioles and the little alveoli. This is considered the functional unit of our lungs. So those bronchioli and the alveoli. Um, and then we know from anatomy and physiology that the gas exchange occurs in the alveoli, which gives us our ventilation. So these are the structures in our respiratory membrane. So Remember, we have the parasympathetic nerve, um, which stimulates the diaphragm to contract and um, to contract and cause inspiration. So we're going to breathe in and breathe out. We have our vagal stimulation, which leads to bronchoconstriction. And then we have our sympathetic stimulation, um, stimulation which leads to our increased rate our increased depth of respirations. And it also helps dilate the bronchi. Um, when we dilate the bronchi, then we get more free flowing air to be able to go through our system. So when we talk about different conditions of our upper respiratory tract, we can have the common cold, we can have seasonal rhinitis, cyanitis, sinusitis and then pharyngeus and laryn pharyngitis and laryngitis. With our lower respiratory tract, the conditions that we can have are atelectasis, pneumonia, and bronchitis. So when we talk about atelectasis, um, atelectasis is when we have the collapse of lung tissue that was once expanded. Um, this occurs as a result of outside pressure that is pushed up against the alveoli, which causes them to collapse. This most commonly occurs as a result of blockage of the airway. We see atelectasis in patients that have had surgery, patients that are not moving. Atelectasis will lead to pneumonia um, because we're not getting that good air exchange in there. So pneumonia, pneumonia is inflammation of the lungs. It can be caused by a bacterial or a viral infection of the tissue. Um, it can also be caused by aspiration of foreign subject, I mean, substances, so food um, or liquid. We see aspiration pneumonia a lot in our older adults, um, patients that have had strokes that have issues with swallowing. And this is when they aspirate and they get these foreign substances into the lower respiratory tract. Um, Pneumonia manifests as localized swelling in that area. Everything um, becomes engorged, and then you have an exudate that starts to develop. Um, in the lungs, it's a very dark, warm environment. And when the um, atelectasis happens and you're not getting that um, 
good airflow through there and then you have the inflammation and all that swelling, it's just a breeding ground for bacteria. And then when we think about bronchitis, bronchitis is just a narrowed airway that happens during inflammation. And it can happen from a number of things. It can be caused by bacteria. It can be caused by a virus. It can be caused by some type of foreign material um, that gets into the body that affects the lining. And then we see chronic bronchitis in patients that have COPD. This is a chronic condition for them. So, this leads us into our obstructive pulmonary diseases. So we have asthma, we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also COPD, we have cystic fibrosis, and we have respiratory distress syndrome. So um, COPD is a permanent disorder and it is chronic obstruction of our airways. Um, it is more than likely related to cigarette smoking. Um, and it's caused from emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Um, manifestations, it's gonna be an airflow obstruction when the patient is expiring. Um, so these patients have a lot of um, volume left in them. So patients that have COPD, they get very barrel chested. Um, if you Google a picture of that, you will be able to, there's probably a, even a picture in your book they have because they always have this excess volume in there, they have a big barrel chest. So this is airflow obstruction on expiration. Um, it causes that overinflation of the lungs, and then they always have um, poor gas exchange. So we obviously have different drugs that act on our upper respiratory tract that we can use to treat. So we have antitussives, we have expectorants and mucolytics, and then we have, um, I can't see, um, a medicine called Zyrtec. So we are going to talk about our antitussives first. So um, yeah, you guys need to have all this information that's all my notes that are in here. So I'm gonna post these afterwards so you can have all this information without having to write it down. So our antitussives, so these work on a cough center that's located in our brain to help depress the cough reflex. So these help to control non-productive coughs. We give these medications for non-productive coughs. You guys need to remember that. If you have someone with pneumonia or COVID and they're having a productive cough, you don't want to stop that cough, okay? You don't wanna give them an antitussive. You wanna encourage them, as annoying as it may be, to continue to cough because when you have a productive cough, you're getting that stuff out of your lungs, which is what we want. So you do not wanna give an antitussive for someone with a productive cough. Um, we don't want to give to patients who need to cough to maintain their airway, and we don't want to give patients who have had a head injury or any kind of impaired central nervous system, and they can't cough on their own. Um, do you want to use cautiously in patients who have a history of narcotic addiction? They can become addicted to this medication. They can abuse this medication. Um, adverse effects. It can be very drying on the mucous membranes, and you can also have some CNS effects. They can be groggy, sleepy, um, and some people complain of nausea and vomiting. So you might see some GI upsetting, upset. We do have topical nasal decongestants that we can give. These cause vasodilation. Um, they cause less inflammation to occur in that nasal membrane. Everything's dilated um, so that you can have relief of nasal congestion that you get with the common cold. You can get it with sinusitis. You can just get it with seasonal allergies or allergic rhinitis. Um, so it helps to keep you from being congested. Um, these topical nasal decongestants usually are not absorbed systemically. Um, you wouldn't want to use in a patient who has any kind of lesions or erosions already in the mucous membranes of the nose. Um, 
Patients that use these might say that they have a local stinging or burning. Um, sometimes you might get what they call rebound congestion. So even though you take it to help with the congestion, the congestion will come back. Um, oral decongestants, we can give these to help um, decrease or shrink the nasal mucous membrane. Um, it promotes drainage of the sinuses. If you can help drain the sinuses, it's ultimately going to improve your airflow. Um, again, these can cause rebound congestion. Um, Over-the-counter products contain um, pseudofedrin. Um, so you want to be careful taking this because they can have serious side effects. And these medications are usually locked up. You can't get these medications over the counter. You have to go behind to where the pharmacy is and have them unlock them because people steal these from the store. Um, we have antihistamines, which help block. If it's an antihistamine, it's going to block the effects of histamine at those histamine receptor sites. It's going to it, um, decrease the allergic response and it's going to have anticholinergic and antipuretic effects. So you would give antihistamines to patients that have seasonal allergies, allergic conjunctivitis, um, sometimes angioedema, which is swelling of the face and around the eyes. Um, Use cautiously in patients that have a history of arrhythmias. It can cause them to have more arrhythmias. It can cause drowsiness and sedation. We have expectorants. So these help to enhance the output of those fluids in the respiratory tract. Um, it reduces the adhesiveness and the surface tension of the fluids, which allows the fluids to move easier. Um, you would give this for res, um, relief of respiratory conditions characterized by a non-productive cough. Um, you might see some GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, maybe some diarrhea. Patients might complain of a headache, maybe some drowsiness. Um, your mucolytics. So this is your mucinex, um, mucinex is how, what we see over the counter. Um, this helps to break down mucus in order to aid um, getting that cough, giving, getting that thick cough up. It brings fluid in and helps um, thin those secretions and then the patients can help cough them up. So you would give these to patients who are having difficulty coughing up their secretions. Um, so these are your COVID, your pneumonia patients. Um, patients who develop atelectasis, um, post-operative patients, patients with tracheostomies, they have a lot of secretion. So you want them to be able to get their um, secretions up. Whoops. Wait a minute, where was I? Okay. Um, Mucolytics. Um, so um, adverse effects can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, you might see stomatitis or rhinorrhea in some patients. It can cause a bronchospasm and some patients might get a rash. This, is, this slide is in your book. It shows the site of actions of all the drugs we talked about and where they work at in the respiratory tract. And now we're going to talk about the drugs that act on the lower respiratory tract. So we have sympathomimetics. This is going to be your albuterol or provental, your epinephrine, your isopril, um, your leva um, albuterol. So these work by, um, they are beta-2 selective adrenergic agonists. We would give these to patients with an acute asthma, um, patients that have bronchospasm from acute or chronic asthma. And we can also give this to patients to prevent exercise-induced asthma. So that's just patients that get asthma when they exercise. Um, some of them are injected, some of them are inhaled. Um, 
you are going to see a reaction in the um, sympathomimetic stimulation. It's going to um, stimulate your CNS. You could see GI upset, cardiac arrhythmias. So a lot of these medications will increase your heart rate. Your patients will become tachycardic, which is something um, if they get a NEV treatment or something like that and they're on an inhaler, their heart will beat fast. Um, and the patients might say, I feel like my heart's beating out of my chest. Is this normal? Well, it is related to these medications. You might see hypertension, bronchospasm. You could see sweating, pallor, and flushing. Um, let's see. Your anticholinergics. These are your Atrovent and your Spiriva. Um, these work to block those vaguely mediated reflexes. Um, by antagonizing the actions of acetylcholine in the body. So they, these are a maintenance treat, treatment that we give to our patients with COPD who suffer from bronchospasms. Um, these medications work pretty quickly when you inhale them, about 15 minutes. Um, you're gonna see um, the peak actions of these medications in about one to two hours and the duration that they last is about three to four hours. So you'll see in the hospital setting that patients um, respiratory will come and treat them every four to six hours because that's about as long as they last. Um, patients might complain of dizziness, headache, nervousness, dry mouth is something common with inhalers, palpitations, um, and sometimes urinary retention. And then your inhaled steroids. So this is your bunesonide or your pulmacort or your flutecazone or your flovent. These um, inhaled steroids work to decrease the inflammatory response in the airway. Um, we give these to prevent and treat asthma. Um, we can use it to treat chronic steroid dependent asthma. Um, they are well absorbed in the respiratory tract. They're excreted in the urine. We would not use this medication for an emergency during an acute asthma attack. Okay, This is not our go-to medicine for emergency asthma attacks. These are to prevent and treat asthma on a long-term basis. Um, adverse effects from these would be sore throat, hoarseness, cough, dry mouth. Um, you might see um, pharyngeal or laryngeal fungal infections because you're breathing it in. Um, and I think that's it. This one was very short. <laughs>